afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoy your bags. I really appreciate that the Fountain of Health team provided them and everything in there should be healthy treat. So is, I wanna start by saying I really appreciate your time because cancer is a topic that's near and dear to me. And let me just ask quickly, who in the room knows someone who's had cancer? My guess is every hand in the room should go up. So I am, when I was practicing, I was a head and neck cancer specialist. And so I mainly focused on everything from here and above. Today, we're gonna to try and cover the whole body, and which is a lot to cover in an hour. And if there are things that we need to talk about at another time, happy to come back and focus on specific cancers. But today, what I really wanna talk about is how you prevent cancer. Because a lot of what we think of as not being preventable is preventable. And my goal is to give you a couple of tips on what you can do from a lifestyle perspective to do that. So in case you have to leave early, I wanted to put these three goals up on the screen. Because when you leave today, what I'm hoping is that you'll understand what are three risk factors, at least three risk factors, so that you know whether you're at risk. Because for those of you who are repeat customers from the talk back in July, um, my key message to you is you have to know your body and you have to own your own health care. So you need to understand your risks. You also need to understand what it means to be healthy. And by healthy, it doesn't mean that you have to be a CrossFitter. By healthy, we mean you need to be active and you need to have a nutritious, healthy, balanced diet. And the last thing is that for those of all of you in the room, and when we go through the screenings, I start low and go high, but you need to make sure you understand what screening exams that you need to ensure that you have a conversation with your primary care provider that you're receiving on a regular schedule. And more importantly, you need to know that if there's something you have a question about, you should feel free to ask your, one of your primary care team, whether it's a physician, the nurse practitioner, um, someone should always be available to answer your questions. So I wanna level set just by making sure that we're all in agreement around what the definition of cancer is. And cancer is really, I think of it as normal cells divide and cells, every cell in our body is dividing and regenerating and that's a normal process. But every now and then, some of the messaging in a cell will get out of control and that cell will start to divide uncontrolled. Normally there's checks and balances so that if the cell starts to divide too fast or it divides in a way that's not normal, that cell will undergo kind of what's called apoptosis or it'll die. But when a cell starts to grow abnormally and grows out of control, that's when cancer starts. Now you can have benign tumors and benign tumors are those that are non-cancerous. So sometimes you'll get a lump or a bump somewhere and that lump or bump may get tested and the doctor may say, that's just a growth of cells, but it's not cancer, meaning it hasn't invaded into blood vessels or other tissues. So I just wanna make sure that you understand that rapid cell growth can result in a benign growth, so something that's not cancerous, or can actually result in a cancer cell. And there's lots of different types of cancer. This is a slide from the National Cancer Institute, and there are over 200 different types of cancer, if you, if you really think about broadly all the different types, and this is in adults and children. But these are the most common ones on this slide, from cancers in your bloodstream, to cancers in your lung, to cancers in your breast, everywhere in your body. Now, these are some stats, and I don't show these to you to make you concerned, but mainly to make you aware of the fact that there is a high prevalence of cancer in the, in the United States. And I know if you look at the, the news, you may think that there's more cancer than there used to be. That's not the case necessarily. Be, part of it is that our population is getting older. And as you'd expect, in an older population, there's probably going to be more people who get cancer, and that's normal. So because we're kind of getting this, our baby boomers getting older, there are probably more people that are being diagnosed with cancer than there may have been previously, but it's not like there's this explosion of cancer. So there's lots of cancer being diagnosed. There are many cancer deaths, but what I really want you to take away are some statistics on what parts of the body are most commonly diagnosed with cancer in the United States. And, and these are the typical culprits. If you're a man, you can see that that's gonna be lung, colon, and bladder. And if you're a woman, it's gonna be lung, colon, and uterus. Now the good thing, and I think this is great news, is that more people are surviving. 
and there's a couple reasons for this, and it's one of the reasons why I also want to talk today about screening. Early detection is key. So we have great ways of screening early. We have great ways of having therapeutic interventions, whether it's radiation, surgery, chemotherapy. Cancer is not a death sentence. But the key for you is one, prevention, and two, screening. Now in Missouri, of course, I want to localize this. So we had a broad picture for the United States. These are local data. And again, the, the top three that you see here on this, on this slide, for female, it's breast, prostate, lung, and then colorectal. And I'm going to touch on these three in particular over the course of the next 40 minutes or so. So what are your risk factors? And again, when you think about knowing your body and managing your health, you need to know what your risk is. And you need to be comfortable having a conversation with your healthcare provider, understanding what those risks are. Because if you were to walk into my office, even though there's lots of statistics up on the screen, you're an individual, you're not a statistic. So I need to understand what's unique to you and use that in the context of the information we know about the the incidence and prevalence of cancer in order to help you understand what you need to do to be healthy. Now here's the key takeaway from today, and I want you to take this to anyone who's not here, anyone in your friends and family. 90 to 95 percent of cancers are the result of lifestyle and environment, meaning that many of them are modifiable risk factors. So I know there's lots of thought, sometimes it's an inevitability. This is not inevitable. There are things that you can do today, and I hope that what you'll leave are maybe take away one or two things you can do in your lifestyle that will make a positive difference and reduce your risk of getting cancer. So, and I, I know most of you who, who know me or, or have heard me talk before think that I just harp on weight, diet, physical activity. This slide isn't mine. This slide is actually from the American Institute on Cancer Research. We have data to show that these three things, which all of us can impact in an individual basis, in our families, in our communities, are key contributors to reducing your risk of cancer. That's maintaining a healthy weight, being physically active, and eating a healthy, well-balanced diet. How many of you are, live or work near a smoker? I won't ask you if you smoke. Okay. So smoking is a significant risk factor for your risk of developing cancer, and, and all of us know that. I mean, these aren't new data. There are lots of chemicals in the bottom picture where you can see that cigarette. There are lots of chemicals that we inhale when we smoke cigarettes that can negatively impact our cells and result in us getting cancer of the upper airways. Now, the good thing is that there are lots of opportunities to stop smoking if you're a smoker, and if you are exposed to secondhand smoke, you're also at risk. So you would also want to encourage people in your environment who are smokers to maybe think about cutting back or stopping. And there are lots of resources available um, from your healthcare providers or from the Fountain of Health team if you're interested in stopping smoking. Now the other thing is, and we're seeing an increasing prevalence of this, is vaping. Um, just because vaping is not a cigarette doesn't mean it, it won't cause cancer. We don't know enough today for me to stand up here and tell you vaping is safe. So I don't want to say, oh, if you don't want to smoke, vape. I would tell you, please don't do either. Um, because one of the risk factors that brought most people into my office for head and neck cancer was being a smoker. Now, if you look at some additional data, so I know, uh, you know a family member of mine said, oh, I only smoke one. That's okay, but your risk is still high. So there's a positive correlation between the number of cigarettes that you smoke a day and your risk of getting lung cancer in particular. So, but I don't want you to say a few is better. A few is better than lots, but zero is better than a few. So if you have an opportunity to encourage people to stop smoking or start to reduce their smoking, there are lots of great programs to help people um, behavioral and lifestyle change, not all medication-based, to help them stop smoking. The next risk factor is nutrition. A lot of people don't think about nutrition as being associated with cancer, but it is. And part of it is, one, what we ingest, and then two, how much. Because 
not eating healthy foods or eating even too much of a good thing can lead to you becoming overweight, which has a positive correlation with increasing your risk of developing cancer. And when you're a little bit heavier and maybe your back hurts, your knees hurt, you're also less likely to be physically active. So that sedentary lifestyle is also one of those factors that contribute. Now from the perspective of what we eat, this is where I need you to think about why what you put in your mouth is very important. So we talked a little bit about maintaining a healthy body weight. And again, this isn't just Daphne saying you need to maintain a healthy body weight. There are lots of data from the American Cancer Society, from the American Institute of Cancer Research that say maintaining a healthy body weight will reduce your risk of cancer. And if you develop cancer, maintaining a healthy body weight will increase your survivorship. And there are lots of other reasons why I want to encourage you to maintain a healthy body weight. But I also want you to think about what you're putting in your body because this has a contribution to reducing your risk also. So I know I grew up, and, and I'll tell you, I used to love that my fried bologna sandwiches that mom used to make, all the salami I used to eat. It, a lot of those foods in moderation are not bad, but if you can avoid eating many of those processed foods in excess, that would be great. So um, you want to choose foods and beverages that help you maintain a healthy weight. And I'm, I'm not going to be prescriptive and tell you there's any one diet, because to me, diet is a four-letter word, and I'm not going to have a four-letter word coming out of my mouth today. You want to maintain a healthy lifestyle. So you'll, I mean, diets and fads come and go. What you want is a lifestyle that you can maintain and one that contributes to your overall health. And if you want a, a good representation, you may go out to um, the, you know, the government has a website on my plate, and that's a good overall goal, you know, looking at portion sizes that are about the size of your fist. But don't think of it as a diet. Think of it as maintaining a healthy lifestyle. And that means choosing whole grains over processed foods. You want to limit your consumption of processed meat and red meat, and I know that's sacrilege in Kansas City. And I'm not saying no, I'm saying don't have it every day if you can avoid it. And then for those of you that like fish, fish, healthy fish is great, and the same with your fruits and vegetables. And I always, when I talk to people about what's healthy on your plate, if you have a multicolor plate, you probably have a healthy plate. So you want to see your reds, you want to see your greens, you want to see your yellows because those aren't meats, those are usually vegetables. So this is just a slide that outlines the colors that may be on your plate and what some of those foods are that in, are incorporated in, and then what are some of those either antioxidants or protective substances that are in those foods that can help increase your ability to be healthy and decrease your risk of getting cancer. So when you look at your plate, whether it's your dinner, lunch, breakfast, think about having it multicolor because that's gonna be a healthy food plate. Now, I wanna go back to the meat because, again, I, I worry that people think this, this is all conjecture, and it's not. Uh, and so I'm trying to back up a lot of the statements I'm making today with real data. And there, you can see what's um, graphed on this slide on the x-axis are the number of grams per day of, the, of meat that people consume, and on the y-axis are the number of cases of colon cancer. And the United States is pretty high up there. So in countries that tend to have a lower consumption of red meat than we do, there's a lower incidence in colon cancer. Now another thing that I also hear frequently is when people think about colon cancer, they don't like to think about, oh, you know, that colonoscopy thing. I had my colonoscopy. It, it, I was in, I was out, I was at, back at work. Um, don't be afraid of the test. Today, a colonoscopy, you don't even think about it. You say hello to the nurse, you say hello to the doctor, next thing you're waking up in recovery. But avoiding a test for what is a preventable cancer is not in your best interest. So if you're 50 or older, like I am, and you haven't had your colonoscopy, you need to think about making an appointment to get that done. And I, I went to Truman, got mine done, excellent job. So here, I'm trying to keep you awake. What kind of foods do you think are linked to colon cancer? Tofu, processed meats, food with hot salt substitutes, microwavable foods, or shellfish? 
I heard the answer over here. It's the process meets. So I won't go, I'll send out these slides later, but again, I'm not saying don't eat any of this. It's really all things in moderation. Um, you know, live, life is precious and life is short, and so I'm never gonna tell you not to eat anything. I will tell you not to smoke. But when it comes to nutrition, try and do things in moderation. So that doesn't mean you can never have barbecue. It means you just wanna limit the number of times per week you're eating barbecue. Physical activity. How many of you are physically active of le at least 30 minutes a day? Okay, that's great. Does that include weekends? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so most days of the week. How many of you actually do any resistance training? So lifting weights, awesome. And then how many of you do anything like yoga or Pilates? That's wonderful. So these are some very basic physical activity guidelines. You want to try and be active 30 minutes a day. And I know a lot of you have physically active jobs and probably the last thing you want to do when you get home is think about going to the gym. Don't think about it as going to the gym. Um, if you have a dog, you can walk the dog. If you want to get out with your family and walk the block. If you just want to, you know, I think about even going for a walk to help your digestion. Think about just getting up and moving. And if you're stuck in an office all day, some of that can be, I mean, I, I'll do squats at my desk, I'll have a standing desk if that's something that's available to you, but what you really want to do is to be active. And for the women in particular, I know that number one, you're not going to bulk up by strength training. So lifting a couple of weights isn't going to make you look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. But what it will do is it'll help you retain your bone density, which is important as we get older. And you don't want to get osteoporotic where you start to slump over. Exercise, things like yoga and Pilates will help you maintain a strong core, which is good for your posture. And especially for those of you who do a lot of heavy lifting or moving things, you need a strong core. So all of these not only contribute to you being healthy, but they also may have a positive contribution to making you less likely to get injured when you're at work by maintaining your strength, your cardiovascular endurance, and keeping a strong core. Alcohol's not bad in moderation. But these recommendations suggest that you limit alcohol to about one drink a day for women and about two for men. And that's not the full glass of wine in, in the big glass wine glass. <laughs> yeah, I hear someone laughing. <laughs> um, it's, it's more like five to five ounces of wine. So when I say moderation, it isn't, we tend to be a country of excess. So you have a big glass, you think you need to fill a big glass. If you can maybe fill the glass halfway, that's probably a better serving size than having the glass filled to the top. If you feel that you are drinking in excess, again, similar to smoking cessation, there are lots of resources available to help you reduce your drinking, or if you know someone who needs help reducing their drinking, making those resources available to them. But this is the second thing. So smoking and alcohol are the two things combined that tended to bring more people into my office than any other risk factor. Um, and when you start to look at them in combination, you can see that they're almost more than additive. So the more you smoke, so on the bottom, on the x-axis on the bottom, you see an increasing number of alcoholic drinks consumed per day and a number of cigarettes consumed per day. And up going on the y-axis is your risk, increased risk of developing a cancer of the esophagus, which is the swallowing tube. You don't want esophageal cancer. You don't want any cancer. Uh, so, but you can see that it's not, a, it's not just one plus one equals two. These things are multiplicative. So reducing your alcohol consumption and stopping smoking are probably the best recommendations, in particular to avoid or reduce your risk of developing head and neck cancer. So another question, trying to make this interactive. What's the most common form of cancer in all humans? I hear the answer. You guys are good, skin cancer. So, you know, if you think about it, your skin is the biggest organ on your body. And for those of you that are outside working, either as part of your daily job or things you may do on the weekends or in the summer, you need to protect your skin. So 
your primary care doctor probably shared with you, and you probably learned this at some point in time, if you have a skin lesion, you need to think about your ABCDEs. Um, and lots of us have moles or freckles or other spots. And similar to maintaining, knowing your body, if you have a spot, you need to find out, is it changing and how it looks? Because that could be a sign that it's gone from being just a normal skin, bot, skin spot to being something that you need to seek medical attention or at least consult your physician to ascertain if it's something that you need to be concerned about. Now the other thing, and again, I'm afraid to ask this question, how many of you indoor tan? And you don't have to raise your hand, I'm hoping there's no hands. Indoor tanning is very common. And uh, if for those of you who may have children, nieces, nephews, kind of the generation below ours, we're probably seeing more and more of that generation using tanning beds. They're cancer beds and they are not safe. I mean, I think this little graphic that I put in is a great indicator that you can pay $11.99 per hour for your basal cell or $19.99 per hour for your melanoma. Um, you don't want skin cancer. I mean, most people think of skin cancer as a little thing that you can get snipped off and you're done. But I remember taking care of patients that had things like malignant melanoma, young women who ended up dying. So when you are outside, you wanna make sure that you're protecting your skin. If you have people that you know are using tanning beds, you want to provide them with the information to let them know that it's probably not in their best interest to be doing that. So these are just some examples of skin lesions. And again, not to scare you or, or not to say, oh, I've got one of those. I, do I need to be worried about it? I mean, it's not uncommon for someone to send me a, a phone, a snapshot of a picture and say, do I, do I need to worry about this thing on my skin? But if you are prone to freckles or moles, just know your body. And if it's changing, if it hurts, if it starts to bleed, if it starts to grow, if the borders become irregular, those are indications that you need to have your clinical care team take a look at that skin lesion. And that's where we get to your ABCDEs. So the A is asymmetry. It may go from being very round and smooth to now it becomes asymmetric. The borders, it's very similar again. Discrete borders, probably more likely to be benign than diffuse or irregular borders. Color. If the color changes or if the color becomes irregular, again, that's something you need to be concerned about. Diameter, if it starts to get bigger, so a sign that it may be growing. And evolving is kind of a combination of all those where it may be changing, morphing, spreading, growing, and you need to seek medical attention. And we have lots of skin lesions. So in particular, if you have lots of freckles or if maybe you suffered skin damage when you were little, um, and for those of you who are dark skinned, we can get skin cancer too. So don't feel that we're immune to needing to have skin surveillance because we, we're darker pigmented. So let's talk about infectious sources. Um, when I was first training, HIV was something that people died from. Now HIV, you don't even hear about it anymore, but it's still something you need to worry about because you can still get infected by the virus, and while it's no longer a death sentence, it still increases your risk of getting cancer. The same with hepatitis, and HPV stands for human papillomavirus. So for those of you who remember when Michael Douglas was diagnosed with throat cancer, there was all of this kind of controversy around its correlation between oral sex, HPV, I think, you know, when celebrities raise attention to some of these issues, it actually helps raise attention for all of us. Human papillomavirus is a very common virus, and for those of you who may have children or you may have actually seen the commercials on television, you can actually receive a vaccination for the HPV virus, which may reduce your risk of both cervical cancer and cancer of the upper air, of the kind of, of the head and neck. For women in particular, you need to understand that your risk of getting cervical cancer increases significantly if you are infected with human papillomavirus. Now cervical cancer is treatable, um, and again, when we talk about your screening exams, you should be getting your regular gynecological examinations, but you do want to know that not having HPV has a significant impact on decreasing your risk, which is one of the reasons we're recommending for our, our children today to receive that vaccination.
Now, the other thing I want to talk about, and you're probably, there's lots of commercials on this too, relates to hepatitis B. Now, screening for hepatitis is not a regular part of health maintenance, uh, meaning that it's not necessarily something that your primary care practitioner is going to say, you need to have this done. But if at some point in your life you were um, involved in activities that may put you at greater risk for hepatitis B or C, you need to have the conversation with your primary care provider so that you can actually be tested. Liver cancer is not something any of us want to get. Um, and again, I think there's, whether it's liver, pancreatic, any of, cancer is bad in general. But hepatitis B and hepatitis C may predispose you to having a higher risk. And so if you do have those risk factors, please have the conversation with your care team so that you can get tested. And the same applies for having alcohol in excess may also predispose you to liver cancer. So those were lots of the risk factors. Nutrition, environment, physical activity, um, infectious diseases, all of these are modifiable risk factors and things that you can go and you can change today to reduce your risk of, of developing cancer in the future. But I also want to make sure that we have a conversation around your screening exams because you know how to reduce the risk, but how do you also make sure that you're receiving the appropriate tests from your primary care team so that if you do have cancer, you're at risk of getting cancer, that you can have that test appropriately. So this is an eye chart, and I'm actually going to break this out in more detail in the next couple of slides, but there are standard recommendations, and a lot of these are embedded into your physician's electronic medical records so that they get reminders about what tests do you, I need to get, make sure that you get when you come in to see me. If you have a patient portal or you have access to a portal from your care provider, you may also get those same reminders. But if you're uncertain, you can always go out to the American Cancer Society, and these are the current recommendations for early detection. So I know all of you in the room are in the 20 to 29-year-old range, and for I tried to break it out men versus women. Um, for women in this age range, you definitely want to think about cervical cancer and breast cancer screening, and for men, Self, a testicular self-exam is something that you also need, be, need to be thinking about when you're in your 20s. When you're in your 30s, not too dissimilar. Again, women, you need to be getting your regular gynecologic examination. And the frequency, number one, going back to those guidelines, those guidelines are for the average American with average risk of developing cancer. If you, for any reason, either have a family history or personal history that may increase your risk, your screening regimen may change. So if you have had abnormal pap smears or if you've had cervical or uterine cancer, these testing guidelines may not apply to you. But th these are what the standard recommendations are for the average American adult. Now as we get a little bit older, we're going to start to add in a couple of more of those examinations. So the colon cancer screening, it's not a standard recommendation yet, but if you have a high risk or if you have a family history of cancer, those screening exams may start in your 40s. For women, again, the mammogram, I feel like the guidelines around mammography change every couple years. Um, so you need to have a conversation with your primary care provider if you have indications to receiving a mammogram in your early, in your 40s. And then for men, Again, it's a little early, but you can discuss with your primary care practitioner whether you need to have a prostate exam. Now, when you start to get up to my age range, I think the testing, you start to feel like everything has to be tested. So we talked a little bit about colon cancer screening. How many of you are afraid of a colon exam? Oh, <laughs> Jessica. <laughs> I'm glad there's some honest people in the room. Don't be afraid. Um, it's a very easy test. I think most people are afraid of the PrEP, which also has gotten much easier than it used to be. But remember, colon cancer is something that can be detected early, and if you have it, it can be treated. Um, so don't avoid the test because of your fear of what it involves. It really is much easier than it used to be five or 10 years ago. Women, again, the screening mam mammogram, your pap smear, and then for men, your prostate screen. And then we're going to end up in over 65, 
similar types of testing required. Um, the frequency will change as you get older, but you still need to make sure, just because we're old, it doesn't mean that we don't need to get tested. And this the same should apply for your grandparents or anyone you may live with or know who's 65 or above. Medicare is pretty good about having these recommendations applied, but for any reason, if you, don't, if you feel that people aren't getting the appropriate examinations, again, that's a conversation they need to have with their primary care team. So um, I added this slide in in particular because um, how many of you have had your annual dental exam? Perfect. Did they do an oral cancer screen? It, there's, so not every hand went up that actually went to their dentist. So when you go to the dentist, your dentist should look at your tongue, look in around your mouth, look at your palate, look under your tongue, kind of feel if you've got any lumps or bumps under your chin. This is an oral pharyngeal cancer exam because cancer of the tongue, of your palate, um, of some of the glands that live in your mouth, a lot of times they're not manifested in a way that is apparent to you. If you may look at it and say, ah, oh, that's been there, I'm not worried about it. You should get an oral cancer screen every time you sit in the dentist chair. And hopefully when you go to your doctor's office for your primary care appointment. If you are a smoker, if you consume alcohol in excess, if you have a risk for human papillomavirus, HPV, or if you've had a prior cancer of your head and neck, you need to be getting these exams regularly. And this also applies to younger people. Um, I see people that are chewing more frequently than I care to think about, and I didn't put chewing up there. But if you're a chewer, um, you know, smokeless tobacco, you also have an increased risk because now you have those products immediately in contact with the skin in your mouth. I know we're getting to the top of the hour. I wanted to touch on this briefly because, one, if you have had cancer, if you know someone who has cancer, you are a survivor. You are a survivor from day one and you need to think about all of the things we talked about from decreasing your risk as also positively impacting your survivorship. So being physically active, eating well, reducing your exposure to cigarette smoke, excess alcohol, those are things that you need to be doing as a baseline to stay healthy, but those same things apply if you have been diagnosed with cancer and you're a cancer survivor. There are programs at the Y, and thank you for Jessica for reminding me to give a call out. Um, having cancer is, it, it is a life altering experience. And for people that have been through that journey, it's one that, it's a lifelong journey because you always worry about either that cancer recurring or a second cancer developing. So there are programs in the community that you can take advantage of for people who are cancer survivors that they can, number one, have a group of other individuals that they can talk with who've been, who've walked that path. But secondarily, you need to stay strong when you're fighting cancer. Uh, and I, you know, when I was training years ago, I remember telling people, go home and rest. Now we tell them, get out and walk, get out and be active. There's a gym, a, a group of women that I've been training with, cancer survivors who do CrossFit. So you need to be strong to stand up to cancer. First of all, going back to know your body. These are some warning signs for, can for cancer. And I use caution, you can see that word, those letters in blue, because if you have a change in your bowel or bladder habits, if you see blood in your stool, if your stool size starts to change, anything that may be concerning, you need to see your physician. If you have a sore that doesn't heal, again, it may just be that you're picking at it, but it could also mean that it is an indication that there's an abnormality there. It could be a small skin cancer. Any unusual bleeding or discharge from a body part that normally shouldn't be having that is another reason for concern. If you have a lump in your breast, in your neck, in your groin, those are things you should also be looking at. Indigestion or difficulty swallowing. This is, so esophageal cancer can be a very silent, have a very silent presentation because usually people don't notice it till it gets to the point where they can't eat or drink with ease. So if you, are, if you think you have you know, an unusual type of indigestion or you're having difficulty swallowing your food, you need to talk to your doctor. The same with you when you examine warts or moles. And if you have a nagging cough or hoarseness, same thing applies. And I can't tell you the number of people I would see who had had a sore throat or a hoarse voice 
and it received four, five, six rounds of antibiotics, they came to see me and they have a throat cancer. There's some things that you can't do anything about. You know, as you get older, your risk of cancer increases. I didn't focus today on childhood cancers, um, mainly because of the audience in the room. And there are definite conversations that we could have if you want to talk about childhood cancers at another time. But your family history, your age, your gender, your race, your genetics, those are things you can't change. That, though, that's the hand you were dealt with. But as we talked about earlier, these are things you can change. And it doesn't only apply to cancer. Some of these apply to obesity. They apply to just living a healthy life in general. So stopping smoking, having a healthy diet, being physically active, reducing your alcohol use, sun exposure. I should have added on there uh, safe sex because again, we're talking about human papilloma virus. If you um, do use any drugs and you're sharing needles, you're thinking about hepatitis B or hepatitis C, those are all lifestyle modifications you can make to reduce your risk. And I want to land just by putting, and again, I'm trying to make sure I'm delivering the message multiple ways. <coughs> Screening is important. So even as you're reducing your risk, make sure you're getting your, your annual test as they're indicated. Know your family history. Um, we don't, sometimes we don't ask as often as we should if you have a family history of X, Y, or Z. Not all cancers are familial in nature, but if you do have a family history, you want to make sure your physician's aware of that. Eating a healthy, well-balanced diet, being physically active, again, I'm on tobacco, cigarettes, snuff, vaping, I'm just going to say zero. Avoid excessive alcohol consumption and then protect your skin. And again, the other part of your skin that I free, always make sure people protect are your ears. Um, the number of, of older people we would see in the office who had those skin cancers on your, your ears, when you're putting your sunscreen here and here, think about putting it on your ears, especially for those of you that are outside working a lot. That was a lot in a short amount of time. Um, again, I appreciate your attention today. Thank you very much.